But what I've really enjoyed about discovering your work is your use of emptiness, or what you call lack, mm. to really make a profound social analysis. Now, in uh, you've been trying to get out of our conversation for a while now, so I won't make you do mm -hmm. you know, repeat your whole book. No, but I'm uh, but um, that uh, if, if you could just tell us a little bit about. Um, your idea of lack and lack projects, and then also your analysis of lack and history of modernity, which is now globalization. That uh, it's just it's a, it's a, such a, a different way to understand history, mm -hmm. and it's also a different way of understanding what Buddhism calls dukkha, mm -hmm. right? The word usually translated as suffering, but you know that only makes sense if we understand it in the broadest possible sense, uh, including what discomfort, dissatisfaction, dis-ease, anxiety, that, that. So, um, yeah, th the basic idea there is, is, I think, pretty simple, that the Buddhist point about the emptiness of the self, in more contemporary language, what that really involves is we, you know, and, and we see this happen. You're seeing this happen, Peter, with your four- and eight-year-old, how as they grow, you know, when they're born, the infant, the, the newborn doesn't have a sense of self. It's something that develops. It's a, it, it has to do with social construction. It's, it has to do with a lot of things. It has to do with learning how to use language. And also, children learn to see themselves in the way that other people see them. It's mm -hmm. part of this acculturation, right? Uh -huh. But what this means, fundamentally, then, is that the sense of self, especially emphasizing the sense of separation, by which I mean the feeling that there's a me inside and you and the rest of the world are outside. That sense of separation, it, it's, it's not real. It, the sense of self is a construct composed of mostly habitual ways of thinking and feeling and acting. And what that means is fundamentally then, because it doesn't have any reality of its own, our sense of self is inherently uncomfortable. Uh, and I think the way that we usually experience and understand this discomfort is as a sense of lack, by which I mean the feeling that there's something wrong with me, something is missing, uh, I'm not quite right, I'm not good enough. Maybe that's right. And of course, I can become better by becoming the best skier and winning and winning the race, right? So obviously, this is a a, a um, s something that encourages that kind of competition, right? right? What I find interesting about this is I think this is one of the great kind of open secrets in the sense that, as far as I can see, we all have this sense of lack, but we don't always realize that everyone else does it. We think it's our own personal problem, and you know we have this sense of oh my God, it's, what, what's wrong with me? And when we can realize that it's something that everyone has, there's something very liberating and very important. But the important point is how, depending on the kind of society we're in, maybe depending on our particular family conditioning, how we understand our sense of lack will vary a lot. So for example, growing up in 20th or 21st century United States, what do we lack? Well, one of the big things that happens is we lack enough money, right? We're not rich enough, or we don't have enough consumer toys. Or given the power of social media and Facebook and the internet and all the possibilities there, we're not famous enough, right? Uh, my, I'm not getting enough clicks on my uh, Facebook accounts and so forth. I mean, and, and there's a number of other things, but what this leads to then is, is what I call lack projects or sometimes maybe reality projects because another way to say the same thing is that we don't feel real enough. And if I can just get enough money or enough consumer toys or whatever, whatever it is out there that I think I'm lacking, if I can just get enough of that, then I'll feel okay, then I'll feel real then this hole, this festering hole at the core of my being will be filled up, as it were. And tragically, of course, all that way of thinking, the problem is that there's something out there that I don't have, all that is really just a symptom of the fundamental problem, which is that there's some delusion of, of separate self. 
The other interesting thing that when, when you understand the sense of self and dukkha in that way, then you look around at society and you see it's not just an individual problem, but society is structured in a way that builds on that. Uh, uh, well, first of all, you look at something like advertising. How does that work? Right? We've got to keep the economic system growing. So you, the whole point of advertising is teaching us what it, what it is that we lack, that particular product, right? If you want to be happy, buy me kind of thing. We, can, we understand that. But we can also see it, I think, more deeply in terms of the way that institutions uh, work because they, they also institutionalize lack. Uh, say, a corporation. As I said earlier, it's, it's never big enough, profitable enough. Uh, its market share is never big enough. So institutions, right. too, they can sort of institutionalize the sense of lack. And, and the point of institutionalization is that it kind of takes on a life of its own, apart from the motivations of the individual people involved. If they're not serving the institution, they're spit out and replaced by somebody else who will continue to play that game of increased profitability and, uh, and growth and so forth. So, I mean, I think the, the sense of lack is also, it's important in terms of a way to understand fundamental Buddhist points in the contemporary world about suffering and so forth. But also, it's extremely valuable if we want to look at uh, the way society is functions. There's a kind of social analysis kind of built into that. We can use it as a way to see where our society is stuck. I appreciate you, how you keep on bringing out about capitalism. It makes me think that uh, the very DNA of capitalism is endless accumulation, that yeah. it can't exist without that. So it's not only, oh, we just need a bit more, but the whole system is based on, on endless accumulation. Some people even say that the birth of capitalism was the birth of a culture of endless accumulation that you don't want to just like get your load of booty, you know, taking your spice run and sit back as a land of gentry, but now you're just going to keep on always accumulating. And that set up the possibility of capital to uh, be a structuring principle. So another way to, sorry, go ahead. Oh, please, please. Another way, the same thing is to talk in terms of means and ends. Uh, I mean, the birth of capitalism is associated with a certain way of understanding land and people and, uh, say, uh, patri uh, patrimony. It's like seeing all of them as means, you know, people simply as, employer, as employees, uh, laborers, seeing land and resources to be exploited in a certain way, and also using using money to make more money. It's like, it, it's a very potent kind of mix. Polanyi talked about this, I think. And then once that starts, it, it just kind of takes on a life of its own and, and it never has enough. And the way it plugs into our individual psychology, I think is very important because, uh, you know, money, money isn't just a, a means of exchange, uh, or something that you can invest to make more money. But given the kind of society we have, it becomes a symbol, really. Psychologically, it symbolizes. I mean, most of us think that uh, if I just have everything I need, then I'm going to be happy, right? So money symbolizes the possibility of happiness. That, that's the irony of it all. Well, the real irony is the fact that... Um, the way the capitalist system works is that it has to keep, how to, how to say it, the, the real irony is that money in and of itself is a nothing, right? It's a social agreement. The numbers in our bank accounts, the pieces of paper, they have no value except insofar as we have this legally enforced agreement. It's our means of exchange. And so the real irony is that the capitalist system at this point needs to grow, needs to keep exploiting the biosphere, the ecosystems, in order to maximize something that in and of itself has no reality whatsoever, money. I mean, there, I think there's a really powerful, profound kind of 
irony there when, once we really understand what's going on. Of course, then having the money, we can translate that to buy anything that we want, but that's the kind of trap that, that we seem to be caught up in. All of the resources, including labor, including uh, capital, whatever money is available, all of that is a means to the end of maximizing you know, profit, which is to say money, which in and of itself is nothing, has no meaning whatsoever, insofar as we can... It's a very weird, weird kind of loop that we're all trapped in, I think. Yeah. Ski, ski racing fell apart for me the very first time that I had success like real success. And I said, and I saw that immediately, I'm like, this will never end. This is going to feed into the next thing. And it's just going to keep going. There's no finish line here. 